Hey, welcome to Scattered Church. I am so thankful that you are gathering together somewhere around the seven cities of Hampton Roads. We are so excited about what God is doing in Scattered Church and are grateful that you are taking the time to gather together with people around you to learn the word, worship together, and encourage one another as a worship gathering. We're excited about what God is going to do. And so now let's come together and let's worship at Scatter Church. There 
Well, good morning, church family. Uh, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19 is where we'll be this morning. Uh, I'm Tim. I'm one of the pastors here. Nice to meet you. If I haven't met you before, would love to meet you afterwards. Pastor Eric will be back next week. And so this morning, we will be in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Uh, last week, Pastor Eric started us off in a series on our values, uh, what we are defined by as a church. A value is something that is true about you that if it were to be taken away, you wouldn't be you anymore. As a church, our values are God's glory, Christ's love, authentic relationships, biblical truth, and transformed lives. Last week, Pastor Eric began helping us understand that God's glory as a value of our life, as something that defines us, as something that defines us as a church, what we mean by that is that we want to glorify God in the big things and in the small things of our life. That we exist to be defined and identified as those whom every area of our life reflects the glory of God by what we think and feel and act, by what we post on social media, by how we respond to an email, by how we react to news that comes before us, by the way that we feel and imagine for those who are not like us. We are to glorify God in everything. That defines us as followers of Jesus. That defines us at First Norfolk. In fact, you take away the glory of God and you have something very different than who we are as a church and, well, who you are ought to be as a Christian. And second, the, the second value, that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the value of Christ's love. You know, what is Christ's love? How do we define, how do we describe that value as a church? Uh, Christ's love is experiencing the love of Christ as life's greatest delight. In like God's glory, if you take this value away, if this no longer becomes something that describes and defines your life, if this is removed from you or lived out in a way that is inconsistent with God's word, then suddenly you are different than who we are as a church and to perhaps go even a little further, if the love of God in Jesus Christ, if Christ's love, if experience the love of Christ as life's greatest delight, and knowing the, the love of Christ as defined and described in Scripture, what that means, if that's not important to who you are, you don't know the love of Christ. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 is going to help us understand the love of of Christ, the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ, what it means that we are defined by Christ's love. Because here's one of the hard parts. Here's one of the hard parts that we need to be careful of in the Christian life. And in fact, that the Ephesians were dealing with, that it's easy to say we are defined by Christ's love, but live like we don't know and identify with Christ's love. What we're going to learn today about Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 is that God's design for you is to experience all of God's everything for you when you experience God's mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out, love for you, a.k.a. Christ's love. You see, it's easy, it's easy to, to live as if Christ's love, as God's word tells us it is, as if that kind of love does not exist because we can easily downplay Christ's love to, in a sense, 
justify our lack of love and even show of hate toward God and those around us. But brother and sister in Christ, that is not what identifies you. That's not what defines you as a follower of Jesus. You are designed by God to experience all of God's everything for you. Not by the groups that you associate with. Not by the uh, career that you choose. Not by the reputation of your family. And not by how others perceive you. Not by the pursuit of gain, whatever that looks like. Not by being successful. Goodness, y'all, three, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 is written by a guy in jail who is suffering and just got done in, uh, in verse 13 saying, man, don't worry about my suffering. Here's what I'm praying for you. You're, you're, everything God has for you is defined, found fully, fully, fully in God's mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out, love for you. God's everything for you is found in Christ's love. That's what Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 is going to teach us. And so if today you're like, man, I want to beat everyone to the restaurant, you know, that's it. Uh, don't listen to the rest. But if you are, do want to stick around, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, let me show you why it says this. Look at verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. And look at how Paul, who's writing this, begins this section. He says, oh, that's Romans. He says, for this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. First half of verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory. Now I'm going to stop there for a reason, because it's okay to do that grammatically. But what you have to see is in the beginning of verse 14, it says, for this reason. Y'all, any time, any time you see that kind of phrasing in the Bible, you got to go back and figure out what the reason is that was stated that Paul, or that the author of Scripture, and now us, Scripture, God to us, is saying these things. Leading up to this text, Paul just got done saying, Church at Ephesus, you were dead, and now you've been made alive together with Christ. You are an outsider, and now God has brought you into his family in Christ. You deserved nothing from God, but now God has given you everything as a fellow heir of Christ. You, have no, you had no name in the name of an enemy that was against God, but now he has given you his name. He goes on, and for this reason now, Paul prays for them. And he prays for them according to the riches of God's glory. Do you, do you see just like how thickly Paul sets this up? And I guess more than that, do you see how thick God lays it on in this text? That whatever is about to follow is based on the reality that you were dead and have been made alive together with Christ. Whatever, Paul, whatever God is about to tell us in this text is based on the reality that you were an outsider and God has brought you into his family. Whatever's about to be said is based on the idea uh, that you did not have God's name and in fact were his enemy and now God has given you his very name. Whatever he's about to say is based on the idea that you deserved nothing because of your sin being separated from God, but God has richly blessed you in the beloved in Christ Jesus. That is, according to the riches of his glory. The thing that makes God beautiful is yours. The, according to the way that he is weighty and valuable, uh, he is blessing you. That because of all of that, Paul is going to tell them there's a result that he is praying to God for. In other words, because you are a Christian, 
Did you know that if you're a follower of Jesus, that those who are Christians, that you have been brought from death to life? Like, did, did you know? Did you know that if you are a Christian, I don't mean you grew up in a Christian house, I don't mean you grew up religious or whatever, I mean you have come to a place where God has helped you see that you were dead and you need to be made alive. Like you were an enemy of God and he wants to bring you into his family. Like if you're a Christian, did you know that you, you had an, a, a name of God's enemy? You were against him and now he gives you his name, and blesses you with all of the riches that God has for you in Christ, that are Christ's, and now yours together. Did you know that as a Christian, what's about to be written is for you? And he lays this on thick. You can feel that when someone says, well, if you're a Christian, then fill in the blank, right? You feel the tension. But with that, we need to kind of nuance what Paul's going to do here. Because God in this text, Paul who wrote it, God as a scripture, he's, he's not going to use this text to beat you up into manipulation to some personal point of view that you ought to have. We do that to each other. Goodness gracious, y'all. It's 2022 Midterm elections are coming up. Y'all watch your heart on this. It, things like, if you are a Christian, you would blank. You would follow blank. You would vote for blank. You would live like this. You would dress like this. And usually those things are the things that you, ideally, in your idealness, would have. And so we use those things to just beat people up about it. Man, that's not what this text does. And sometimes, sometimes in a healthy way, uh, God's word helps us see that because you bear the name of Christ, there are characteristics and behaviors of your life that you ought to have and ought to not have. Like you shouldn't live like people who don't know God. That's like all the epistles, right? They, they keep saying, because you know Jesus, don't do that anymore. That's not who you are. You are alive. You're not dead. Stop walking in sin. Like that's, that's healthy. When a brother or sister in Christ comes alongside you and says, hey, like you've believed in Jesus, right? You know, I, I, I see the direction of your heart towards your wife and kids. And man, let, that's not what God wants for you. Okay, that, that's, that's good. That's good, right? There's a healthy way to come alongside and say, because you have been dead and now made alive, because you bear God's name, because you're in his family, because he has promised to richly bless you in Christ, because you are a Christian, this is what ought to be. But even that is not what this text does. So what does it do? Why does God lay it on so thick. And if you read uh, Ephesians chapter 1 all the way through until this point, it's like bam, bam, bam. It is about as thick of a theological, beautiful gospel message as you can find in the New Testament. Why is this laid on so thick? What is he going to do with this? What's the result he's going for? Is he going for behavior modification? Is he going for kind of some kind of manipulation? Or is he going for something else? And the answer is this. Verses 16 through 19. The result that he is going for is that you, as someone who has been bought and redeemed, made new, made alive, made, given the name of God, brought into his family, richly blessed, in Jesus Christ, that you would know that you experience the way you drive, the way you experience everything God has for you. If you want to know what it looks like to experience everything God has for you, that you experience everything God has for you when you experience God's mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out, love for you, also known as Christ's 
love. And that God has designed you as a follower of Jesus to be filled his all everything that he has for you by experiencing and knowing the love of God shown to us in Christ. This is beautiful. You see, like when I was reading, when I'm reading this, I, you know, I don't know, sometimes like you feel like when someone starts throwing out all this stuff, it's this massive stick and that God's just developed through the first couple of chapters of Ephesians. This, I mean, he, that he can swing with and he's God. He swings pretty hard. And so like he, man, and then what swoops in is, I'm gonna use this stick that I could beat you down with to prop you up and help you understand in an even greater way my love. That's what Paul wants for the Ephesians. That you would know God's love. No, experiencing his love is the pursuit of your life to know and receive all of the fullness of all the things that God has for you. It seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? Like almost illogical. Not because in one sense we, we can't fathom a love that would be that big. You know, kind of we can, not really, but kind of. But because you know you. And you know others around you. It's easier to live like areas of our life or whole lives of other people are outside of the love of God. That there is no hope and no help. That this thing that I hide or this uh, guilt that I feel or this area of my life, the depths of my darkness that's deep down within, the bigness of the thing that I've done, the lowness of how I've gone, the length of time I've been doing it, the width of all that I have done. There's no way that God's love is like that, that big for them or for me. I'm going to go a step further, just practical application. Ready? Ready? Earlier, Pastor Kurt talked about our adoption of an Afghan refugee family. They don't believe in Jesus, most likely. When you see those kinds of images, are they outside of God's love? When you see marches for a worldview that you don't agree with, are they outside of God's love? When someone wins that you don't think should have won or did win, is that person and those people outside of God's love? When you fail again, are you outside of God's love? And here's what this text is going to help us see in verses 16 through 19. That you can never, ever be outside of God's love because his love is so much bigger than anything you can throw in and out of your life, I promise. Look at verses 16 through 19. And if you'll notice on the screen, it's a little bit jumbled. And the reason why the, uh, the, the text is a little bit jumbled is because I jumbled it. I did that. I, it's not like that in your Bible. I, I did that. I jumbled it because this is like one massive long run-on sentence. Not just 16 through 19, but pretty much the whole thing. It's one jumble. And like any run-on sentence, if you're not careful, you can go somewhere crazy with it and miss what's actually being said. And so in this, what we're going to have to do is do one of two things. The first direction is we can kind of like track the grammar 
you know, that, doesn't that sound fun? And we could um, uh, identify uh, the subject as God, and then it becomes Christ, and then it becomes this understood you, and then kind of track what's being said about those things and how it develops here, then down here, and then down here. Like, we, we could do that, or we could do this. A stapler in jello. Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, a grammar hunt sounds super fun. And, and for the one of you that thinks that, great. But I'm going to go this direction today, okay? A stapler in jello. Now, you, you, if you know, like, where this idea came from, we could probably be friends. But what this does is this helps us see verses 16 through 19. The nuances that are there, lining them out to understand what God is saying to you as a Christian who has been brought into his family, as a Christian who was dead and is now alive, as someone who has been given his name, though you were an enemy, now you are brought into his family as his child, as someone who had nothing and now in Christ is a recipient of all things that God has promised in relationship with him. Here's the first thing this jello stapler is going to help us understand. Are you ready? The result of God strengthening you is for Christ to take possession of us in an ever greater degree. Follow these lines with me in the text. Here we go. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant you to be strengthened so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, would understand. Here's one of the things that comes out of this text, that the result of Christ's strengthening is that Christ dwelling in your hearts, the belief in him, the, the faith that you have in him, that his dwelling in your hearts by faith, and the foundation upon which you stand, the love that you stand, the being rooted and grounded in love, that Christ dwelling in your hearts, and you being rooted and grounded in Love That God would strengthen you to know in an even greater way Jesus Christ and his dwelling in your life and the love that he shows for you and for others. That, that would be an even greater foundation. That's what Paul's praying. And you might ask, why? I believe in Jesus. I, I have all things that are to me. That's what we just got done saying. Paul said, for this reason. That is true. You need to know that absolutely, 100%, the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ and confess your sins and he forgives you and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are saved. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, Paul says this, doesn't he? He says, in him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Yes, absolutely. When you believe in Jesus, he is all you need for salvation. You are saved forever. You will stand before the throne of God. You will uh, have his name. You will inherit what God has promised you in Christ Absolutely, that is all of God and not of you. That is called positional sanctification. I, positionally before God, have been made right, set apart, standing out for God. But Paul knows also what you and I know and what Scripture teaches and what this text is teaching that absolutely you have been saved and redeemed. And also, you ought to believe more in Jesus today than you did when you got saved. And you ought to be more rooted and grounded in love today than when you got saved. 
In the same way, in the same way that we would look at someone who's 55 or 60, who's throwing a tantrum like a five or six-year-old because they didn't get their way. Or someone who's 40 throwing a tantrum like a four-year-old. Or 30 throwing a tantrum like a three-year-old. I have a, a toddler right now. Or I mean, a preschooler right now. So that's, you know, right? Like, I know what that looks like. And, well, I, well, I know us because I've been around here since 2006. Like, I, I know us. And so, like, when you do that, you go, hey, if, if just in life, you, you, you see those things, you go, something's off, right? That, you're not acting grown up. In the same way, in the same way. There is a reality that practically, as we grow in a greater knowledge of Christ, a greater belief in him, as we understand what it means and actually are more grounded, standing firmer on the foundation of love for God and love for others that he has called us to as followers of Jesus. We are changed that the salvation that we have received, we are now working out in our lives, that we have been saved by faith through grace. And that's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. Because we are created for, by Christ Jesus, for, in his workmanship, for good works, that we would walk in them. Like, that's, that's chapter two, right there. So, like, we understand the reality that as we grow as followers of Jesus, God has designed us to be more like him. Paul knows this for you. He knows this for the Ephesians. And now God is speaking to us and helping us see that one of the things that we ought to pray for is God, help me know you more and stand more firm in your love. In the same way that over time, when I dangled this stapler, <laughs> sorry, stapler in the red jello, should be yellow, in the red jello, they're out of yellow and red was cheaper, in the red jello, over time, it grew more firm and more hard. And right now, you can't move that thing. When I, uh, when I first uh, texted the tech team, I was like, hey guys, um, or uh, Steve and Chad, I was like, I need like, like, I need like a, like a 500 gallon tank and uh, full of jello, and, and then I need it to explode. Can we do that, right? And um, it's for an illustration. It's going to be really good. It's all about God's love, right? Who wouldn't, you know, why would you say no to God's love? And so, for some reason, that didn't go. And I thought it would be really cool. I thought if we had a giant 500-gallon thing of Jello and a staple in the middle, uh, stapler in the middle, like, that would work. And then, like, afterwards, we could have a, a, a low-fat snack together as a church, you know, of Jello, And uh, enough for everybody. We could, <laughs> this, we could call it a Jello ship. Like a fellowship with Jello. You guys, if we don't do that as a church this summer, we have missed out on something, right? Like that's, that's a great idea. Okay, maybe not. That's why I don't make those kinds of decisions. But like in this reality, the truth is this stapler is just an ordinary stapler. I took it off Philip's desk. It's just ordinary. I don't know. And so it's just an ordinary stapler. Nothing special about it. It doesn't do anything on its own. Like, even automatic staplers got to be plugged into power. This one, you got to actually, like, use your hands and stuff. Like, it, it does nothing on its own. It wouldn't have gotten in the jello on its own. I put it there, and then I held it there with this fishing line until it hardened around it. This, my friends, is God's design for you with his love that the longer you exist in his love, the firmer you become, the more filled you are with it. Or as Paul puts it in this text, that you would, that Christ would dwell in your hearts greater through faith and that you would be greater rooted, rooted and grounded in love. Look at the second thing we see, the, the, the result that Paul is praying for, why he's praying for them, because they are Christians. He's praying 
that God, that the, the, he's praying that God strengthening you would help you understand the mind-blowing scope of God's mind-blowing forever in every direction inside and out love for you. If you want how this works later, email me and I'll send you all the lines and what it all, like I'll do that. But here's, follow this line of thought that's in these passages. Ready? Here we go. Looking back at verses 16 through 19. That he may grant you to be strengthened, that you, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This passage helps us understand that God's design for you, that the result that Paul was praying, that God would strengthen them to know and understand in an even, in, in an even greater way, is looking at verses 16 through 19, is the height of God's love from the stapler up. The width of God's love, the sides in every direction. The, I'm going to cheat. The, uh, the uh, uh, breadth of God's love, the length of God's love. Thank you. The length of God's love. How long this thing could be forever. The depth of God's love. Both from the stapler down, all jello. Afterwards, you're welcome to stick your hand in there and touch. All jello. But even with that, the nuance of this word is also to the depths of your soul, to the inside, to the, de to the deep, to the darkness. That God's love for you is absolutely mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out. And it's difficult to understand. Look at verse, uh, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. About half of you, when I put a stapler in jello, we're like, what in the world is that? That doesn't even make any sense. Aha! See? The love of Christ, the love of Christ, comprehending that, not the stapler in jello, comprehending that, the fact that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter the depth of your sin, no matter how high you've gone, no matter how long you've been failing at it, no matter how big this thing is overtaking your life, at no point do you exceed God's capacity to love you. He loves you. He loves you in a way that is mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out, love for you. Y'all, I, I love my son. I do. We, uh, we play this game, and if you've ever had kids or like been around them, or whatever, uh, you can imagine that like love for your kids is illogical. It doesn't make sense. They take advantage of you. Uh, they wake you up in the middle of the night. They always want something. They always need something. And I'm talking about when they're in their 20s. When they're younger, <laughs> man, it is like, it's hard. It's hard. And they don't mind at all. My love for my son, I love my son. And I know it doesn't make sense. We play this game kind of every night. Uh, every night it's my turn for bedtime. Uh, I totally stole this from a guy named JD years ago. I was watching it and I was like, oh man, if I ever have kids, I'm gonna do that too. And so I stole it from him. Thanks, JD. Appreciate it. And uh, so every night uh, at bedtime, what I do is... Um, after we do, you know, the routine or whatever, and he goes down, when I get to the door, I stop and turn around, and uh, 
And I try to remember something that he did that day or just that I've noticed uh, that I'm thankful for or this just that's silly. So last night it was, uh, I'm really thankful for, uh, it was, it's really cool to watch your imagination uh, with how you play Spider-Man, you know? And, and I like it too because I like playing Spider-Man. I mean, so, um, so uh, you know, and he, he laughs. And then I say, but do I, do I love you because you're Spider-Man? Well, no, you know, no. Um, and he'll say, no, I'm not Spider-Man. I'm Tolson, you know? <laughs> like, I know, you know? And then I'll say, uh, hey, I, I, I love uh, your learning stuff. That's really cool. It's cool to watch you learn. I, I think you're smart. I do. I think my kid's smart, and everyone does. Uh, every parent thinks their own kid is smart, not mine. I mean, um, so, but do, do I love you because you're smart? No. And we'll go on, and then it starts to get silly. He'll say, Daddy, do you love me because I have stinky piggies, you know? And no, and you do have those, but like, no, you know? Like, of course not. Uh, do you love me because uh, I... Uh, uh, take care of Rosie. You're like, no, that's our dog. No, you know, like, no. I, um, and then at the very end, I'll say, why do I love you? And about 75% of the time it works, about 25% he's four. So <laughs> I'll say, but why do I love you? And he'll say, because I'm your son. Because he's Iron Man. That's what he's saying in this moment. I love that you're Iron Man, buddy, but that's not why I love you, right? I love you. See, that's the 25% right there. At church, in front of everybody. It's just how it works. I love you because you're my son. Like, that, that's cool, what you're le learning and what you're thinking and what you're doing. One day, it'll be cool what he does for a career. I, I have no idea, but it's going to be awesome, whatever that is. On the other side of that, my son will, we all disappoint, don't we? We all disobey. We all fail to meet the standard. We've all embarrassed God. We've all ignored what he said. We've all gone our own way. We've all sought to pursue something much lower than him, as if it is him. But you have to know, follower of Jesus, that way beyond anything that I can do for my son, my love is limited. It's limited because I have faults and I have failures. And I get tired, and I get hungry. And my time isn't forever. But God never fails. He never grows weary of you. His patience is always perfect. He never has a moment where he just needs a snack, and so he's snapping. At no point in any moment does God's love fail. And you, as a follower of Jesus, you, as one who does not know God, are designed to know the limitless love of God. The love of God that is mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out. That God doesn't love you because you're smart or because you have a good career or because you're handsome or beautiful or because you're Spider-Man or whatever. God doesn't love you because you have a good paying job or because you have lots of money or you are generous to the community or you vote responsibly or whatever. He doesn't love you because you're a good person. He doesn't love you because you work hard. He doesn't love you because you have followers on 
social media. His love isn't affected by your obedience. His love for you isn't affected when you misrepresent him. His love for you isn't affected when you disappoint him. His love for you isn't affected when you betray him. His love for you isn't affected when you distance yourself from him. His love isn't affected by your sin, no matter the height or the depth or the width or the length of your sin. God's love is is not affected for you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you and he will love you forever. There is a a king sitting on a throne with a Galilean accent uh, that was a Jewish carpenter on earth who is God with with, uh, holes in his hands and in his feet as a sign of ruling who is God who says, I love you. I love you to the point of death. I love you forever. That's God's love. It is not limited. It will not fail. No matter your background, where you've been, God loves you. It will not fail. That's God's love for you. This is what you're designed for. And this is what God has designed your life in Christ to be identified with, to define you, to be a value for you. That in this, when you know and understand the vastness of God's love, when you begin to realize and live in that believing in Jesus and being rooted and grounded in faith in him and love for him and love for others, what you have been designed for as you live out and know and understand more and more in a greater way, that kind of love that God has for you, you begin to experience all of God's everything for you. Look at the end of verse 19. I'm not making this up. Look at the end of verse 19. It says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's beyond understanding why he would love his enemy, why he would love those who are against him, why he would love sinners. No, he has a love greater than all of that. That surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of him. Literally with all the everything, with all the everything of God. God has designed you to experience all of God's everything for you when you experience God's mind-blowing forever in every direction, inside and out love for you. Christ's love. So what do we do with this? Well, we do what the text is doing. We pray for God to strengthen us to experience the love of Christ as life's greatest delight. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're a follower of Jesus, I I want to ask if you hide something that's bigger than you or something that you think is much deeper or something that's been going on for a long time or something that's just encircled you your whole life. It eats you up and you hide it. And you think, I don't just mean I know God loves me, but you really think that this thing is something that's beyond God's help, beyond God's love. If you have something like that, If you're a follower of Jesus, would you take this time to ask God to strengthen you to experience the love of Christ as life's greatest delight? So often we take something like that, we jump to behavior modification, but the problem isn't our behavior. Man, the problem problem is much deeper, much higher, much lower, much broader than that. And the first step applying this text is to ask God to strengthen you to know God's love. 
which swallows that thing up whole. At no point, at no point does that change his love for you. Are there changes that need to be made? Well, yeah, it's called sanctification. Yeah, yeah, but at no point, at no point, if you believe that makes you unlovable by God, man, ask God to strengthen you to believe he loves you even with that. Second, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and there is a neighbor, family member, city, nation, group of people that you would say they are beyond God's love. If you're a follower of Jesus, like that's, man, that's so different than the Bible. It's different than God's description of his own love. Don't you remember? You also were dead. You also were an enemy. You also were a trespasser. And God's love was big enough for you. It's big enough for them too. So if you're in that category, would you pray that God would strengthen you to experience the love of Christ as life's greatest delight? That they would experience the love of Christ as life's greatest delight. And last, if you aren't a follower of Jesus, but today, God has strengthened, strengthened you in your inner being, like to the depths of your soul, kind of like in verse 14. He has helped you see and understand his love for you. Someone who has sinned against God in all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the gospel. And today, God's opened your eyes to see and your, your ears to hear, like you're hearing, man, you've never heard this before. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times, and, but you've never heard it like this. And God is capturing your heart to say, would you believe in me? Would you trust that I love you? I love you enough to send Jesus to die, give my only son, so that if you'd believe in him, you, you wouldn't be separated from me forever. But you would be made alive. You would be brought into my family. God would say you will go from enemy to having my name that you would inherit all things that he has for you in Jesus Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus and today you want to lean on the love of God to forgive you of your sin and make you new, then I'd ask you to pray this to the Lord. Something like this. Uh, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. But God, I know that you love me. And I know that your love is bigger than anything I have. God, I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would help me by your spirit to follow you. God, strengthen me now to experience your love as my life's greatest delight. Whether you're not a follower of Jesus or you are, let's respond together with courage and conviction that we would walk out of here loving God to a greater extent, more firmly in the foundation of his love than when we came in this morning.